I had no idea seven years ago that I would be here in Trinidad and Tobago and I made a rather awkward comment that was discovered on YouTube but it was meant in praise of all of you I was speaking to an audience in Houston Texas and one of the brothers from Trinidad uh, had come to Houston and he'd given a presentation about Islamic schools and tahfil and whatnot and we were all very impressed and I was given the final speech of the day and so to make the point I basically said who's ever heard of Trinidad and Tobago and yet still we find so much Muslims over there and in fact it is true that unfortunately not too many Muslims in America are aware that there are alhamdulillah thriving Muslims here in Trinidad and Tobago frankly Americans are very bad in geography so many of them were not even aware there are islands called Trinidad and Tobago unfortunately uh, but alhamdulillah here I am uh, so many years later uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me to have a very very wonderful journey uh, to see the brotherhood and the sisterhood here in uh, Trinidad and my topic today of course is about Muslim unity and uh, no doubt subhanallah on a personal note even before I began my lecture that wallahi many of you know I travel around the world I travel to so many countries I travel to uh, so many cities in America Canada England Europe and it truly is amazing to see the global ummah it is amazing to walk into a masjid today I walked into a masjid here in uh, Trinidad five days ago I was in a masjid in uh, outskirts of London uh, ten days ago I was in a masjid in the middle of Mumbai and literally just you walk in and nobody knows you nobody knows you 
but you know exactly what to do, you know where to go, you know the brothers are seeing you, they're gonna say, Salaamu Alaikum. They don't recognize you as some big sheikh or something, they recognize you as a stranger, but as a Muslim stranger. They recognize you as somebody new because you're dressed differently, because you're not a part of that small little masjid. And there's this brotherhood, this ukhuwa. And wallahi, you understand the reality of what it means when Allah says in the Quran, Innama al mu'minuna ikhwa. All the believers are ikhwa. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about this reality. And it is beautifully demonstrated in an incident that took place in around 30 Hijrah or so. When a young man went to travel to study Islam and he entered into the capital of the Muslim world, Damascus. Damascus was the beginning of a new civilization. And this young man did not know it at the time he was to become the judge of Damascus. He was to become the judge of this grand city. But right now he's still a student. His judgehood will wait another 20, 30 years. Right now he's coming as a new student, beginner. And he enters the masjid. And he says, his name was Abu Idris al-Khawalani. He's a famous scholar. At the time he was not a scholar, but he became a famous scholar. And he said, I entered the masjid, I saw a young man, a young man with a bright forehead and who was prone to silence. He wasn't a rabble rouser causing attention and the people around him were gathered in humility and awe. Every time he spoke, they listened and paid attention. When he opened his mouth, they were in silence listening to him. And I pointed to the guy next to me, I said, who is this man? Who is this guy that there are people double his age? I recognize one or two Sahaba older than him and they're sitting at the feet of this young man. Who is he? So the man next to me said, don't you know, this is Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Now pause here before I go on. Who is Mu'adh ibn Jabal? Mu'adh ibn Jabal was the scholar of the Sahaba despite his young age. He died when he was barely 30, 40 years old. He died a young man. But he was the faqih. He was the jurist of the scholar. In one hadith, our Prophet ﷺ said that when the day of judgment will happen, the scholars will all be in one area and Mu'adh ibn Jabal will be their leader leading them on that day. That's Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And he was a young man and he died a young man relatively compared to the other Sahaba. So he said, Abu, uh, Abu Idris said, as soon as I heard that this is Mu'adh, a love of him entered my heart. Love entered my heart. And I said, I will become a student of this man. And that's how he became the judge. That's how he became the faqih. He studied under Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And so he said, I'm going to come the next day, the first to the masjid. So that when Mu'adh ibn Jabal enters, I will have one-on-one -on -one time with him. Privacy. Because he knew Mu'adh would pray in the masjid early on. So he said, I entered the masjid in the middle of the night. And lo and behold, Mu'ad was praying to Hajjud behind the pillar. Mu'ad beat him anyway to the masjid. So I waited and when Mu'ad said this to Salam, he noticed my presence around me. And he turned around and I walked up to him and I said, Assalamu alaikum. And he said, Wa alaikum as -salam. And I said, Wallahi, O oh, Mu'ad ibn Jabal, I want you to know, Inni uhibbuka fillah. That I love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I love you for the sake of Allah. When Mu'ad, and he doesn't know who this young man is, he's never met this young man in his life. When Mu'ad heard this, he held on to his collar and he dragged him close. And he said, did you swear by Allah? Allah? This is a big thing, you know, you're swearing by Allah. Allah? You swear by Allah that you have a love for me just because of Allah. You don't know me. You never met me before. But you say you have this connection just because of Allah. So Abu Idris said, Allah, I swear by Allah that I love you for the sake of Allah. Three times Mu'ad told him to swear and Abu Idris swore. So Mu'ad then said, if what you say is true, that you are saying you love me for the sake of Allah, let me tell you what these ears heard from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let me tell you what I heard directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that on the day of judgment, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will place people who love one another for the sake of Allah 
upon pulpits made out of light. Manabira min nur. You know what the khatib stands on is the mimbar. What the khatib stands on is the mimbar. On the day of judgment, there will be mimbars placed. Made out of what? Divine light. They will be made out of light. Can you imagine? You are standing and there's nothing underneath you, but you see a light. There's going to be a light that you're standing on. And the people who loved one another for the sake of Allah will be on these lights above everybody else. And our Prophet ﷺ said, even the Nabiyun and the Siddiqun will feel jealous of that honor and privilege. Even the Prophets and the Siddiqun, will, the Siddiq is the highest level under the Prophet. And Nabi is Siddiq. And then Shaheed. Shaheed is level number three. And then Salih, which is level number four. Being Salih or righteous is level four. Above that is Shaheed, above that is Siddiq, above that is Nabi. The Nabi and the Siddiq will feel jealousy looking at those Muslims. They didn't have long tahajjuds. They didn't have half a million check charity. They didn't build orphanages. What did they do? They had genuine love in their hearts. Genuine camaraderie, respect, rahmah, mercy, compassion, tenderness for all those who professed La ilaha illallah. And they will be placed upon this mimbar. And Mu'adh ibn Jabal, the hadith goes on. That Mu'adh ibn Jabal said this to Abu Idris al-Khawalani. And Abu Idris was so happy because he's never heard this hadith before, that he goes outside the masjid wanting to tell every Muslim he, he meets. Do you know what I just heard? Mu'adh ibn Jabba told me this. Do you know what I heard? Mu'adh ibn Jabba told me this. And as he's walking out, another sahabi comes to pray in the masjid early in the morning. And this sahabi is uh, the famous sahabi uh, Ubadah ibn al-Samit. Ubadah ibn al-Samit. He meets Ubadah ibn al-Samit. And he says to Ubadah ibn al-Samit, Do you know what I just heard Mu'adh ibn Jabal say? And he narrated the whole hadith to him. So Ubadah said, Let me tell you as well what I heard from the Prophet ﷺ. Beautiful. He got two hadith for the price of nothing. He got two hadith for free directly from the people who heard it. That was a blessed time. Those were blessed eras. You walk around, you meet one sahabi here, another sahabi there. And here's Abu Idris al-Khawalani. Allah blesses him because why? He wanted to pray tahajjud in the masjid. He wanted to go early to say salam. He wanted to express his love for Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Allah blessed him with two hadith that he didn't know before. And so Ubadah ibn al-Samid said, let me tell you as well what I heard directly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, so this is a hadith Qudsi. You know what hadith Qudsi? A hadith Qudsi is a sacred hadith. A hadith Qudsi has extra honor. A hadith Qudsi is extra special. Why? Because Allah spoke it. It's a hadith that Allah spoke. And our Prophet ﷺ narrated. Our Prophet ﷺ will narrate that Allah said something. And this makes it a hadith Qudsi. And in English, hadith Qudsi means a sacred hadith. And it's called sacred because Allah spoke it. So a hadith Qudsi is a hadith that has extra nobility. Every hadith is noble. But hadith Qudsi, the wording or the, the, the meaning is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. So the Mu'adh ibn Jabal told him one hadith. Then he goes outside, Ubadah ibn Samit told him another hadith. And this is a hadith Qudsi. What is the hadith Qudsi? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, Wajabat mahabbati. Wajabat, wajib. It's wajib. It's obligatory. My love has been made obligatory for those who love one another for me. My love, Allah's love, has been made obligatory for those who love one another for my sake. And for those who visit one another for my sake. And for those who give one another gifts for my sake. And for those who establish the ties of kinship for my sake. And this beautiful long hadith, which is actually two hadith in one with an incident of Abu Idris. You understand there's an incident and two hadith. This is a long narration found in the Mustad of Imam Ahmad in an authentic narration. And these two hadith are central to understand the blessings of being ikhwa in Islam. And what exactly does ikhwa mean? Allah says in the Quran, the believers are ikhwa. The believers are ikhwa. Well, many of us translate ikhwa as brothers. But the word akh actually comes from an original Arabic word called, or comes from the three-letter verb wakha, wa, kha, ya, wakha. 
And wakha means to intend good for somebody. Wakha means to intend good for somebody. So your akh is somebody whom you want good for, linguistically. And that's why your brother is called your brother, because you want nothing but good for your brother. You have nothing but positive intentions for your brother. And in the Quran, the word akh is used not just for blood brother. It's used for many different connotations. It's used for somebody who is a real brother. Yes, that's also in the Quran. But it's also used for somebody of the same tribe, of the same religion, of the same ethnicity, and of the same ummah. All of these usages are found in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has said, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً And this is not translatable in English because the word إِنَّمَا even though it's only one word it's actually a very profound word. إِنَّمَا is a word that is exclusive. The believers are nothing other than brothers. This is what إِنَّمَا means. The believers are nothing other than brothers. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to all Muslims as brothers. In another verse in the Quran, Allah says, وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا That all of you should hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not separate from that rope. And Allah says, remember, He was the one who brought your hearts together after you hated each other so much. If you were to give all of the money in this world to bring those hearts together, they would not have come together. But Allah brought those hearts together. Allah is talking about the Sahaba. Allah is talking about the Ansar, the Muhajirun. Allah is talking about the Aus and the Khazraj. The Aus and the Khazraj were waging a civil war for 100 years before Islam. For 100 years before Islam. And the fact of the matter is, we find these tensions amongst the hypocrites resurfacing of the Aus and Khazraj. So Allah says, if you were to give all of the money in the world to bring these people together, that money would not have brought them together. Allah is the one who brought all of them together. So Allah is saying that of the greatest blessings He has given you is the blessing of brotherhood being brought together. All the money in the world could not purchase what Allah has granted the Ummah free of charge. And what is that? إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ ikhwa. You could not buy with any power in this world, with any wealth, what Allah has automatically gifted the Ummah. Wherever you go in the world, my dear brothers and sisters, you have people that will help you out. You have an Ummah. You have those who understand your situation, will sympathize with you, will know who you are, where you're coming from. They'll share your ethics, your values. They'll share your system. They will know to help you out just because you are a member of this Ummah. And this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this concept of ukhuwa, this concept of brotherhood to reinforce the rights of one Muslim over another. Allah reminds us of our rights with the term ikhwa, with the term of brotherhood. For example, and this relates to some fiqh issues. For example, Allah azza wa jal says in reference to the guardians of orphans, so suppose you have a distant cousin, he dies, he has young children. You will take these orphans and raise them. But they have money that their parents left them. And you have this money and you have to save it for the orphan. We all know the orphan's property is sacred. We know this. But Allah says, if you're forced to take some of the money to take care of them, if you're poor, Allah says, وَإِن تُخَالِطُوهُمْ فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ If you must take some of the money to feed them, then remember, they are your brothers. Allah Azza wa Jal is talking about the guardians of orphans that are not son and daughter, or else they wouldn't be orphaned. They're not nephews and nieces. These are orphans, distant relatives, strangers. You have an orphan in your household. And Allah says, look, if you must take some of the money, remember in the end of the day, these Muslims, even though they're children, even though they're 30 years younger than you, فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ They are your brothers. How would you want your brothers to be treated? Would you eat the, brothers, the money of your brother like this? In another verse, 
with regards to Muslims fighting one another, with regards to Muslims going to war with one another. In this context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ Realize that the believers are brothers, so reconcile between your brothers. The rest of the ummah should get involved if two groups are fighting. The rest of the ummah is obliged to help out when two groups are fighting. Allah says, all of you are brothers, so you should call sulah, reconciliation between the brothers. With regards to backbiting, with regards to talking about brothers behind their backs, what does Allah say in the famous verse of Ujurat? Allah Azza wa Jal says, أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتَ Can you imagine eating the flesh of your dead brother? And Allah reminds us, فَكَرِهْتُمُوهُ You would be disgusted, so how can you backbite? So when it comes to backbiting, once again Allah says, Who are you talking about? Who are you talking about? He is your brother. Would you like to eat the flesh of your blood brother? No. So then how can you eat the flesh of your Muslim brother? And by eating the flesh it means backbiting. Even with regards to murder, which is the greatest sin you can do. The one who murders another Muslim unjustly. This relationship, can you imagine the murder and the murdered? Can you imagine the killer and the killed? Can you imagine a further hatred between the two? What does Allah say with regards to the rights of and the privileges of the one who has been murdered over the one who killed him? There is a haqq and that is the haqq of execution. What do I mean by this? Let me explain this point. In Islamic law, in Islamic law, if a man kills another man unjustly, we're not talking about self-defense, we're not talking about unjustly, then the sharia allows the relatives and family of the one who was murdered the right to retaliate in the Islamic court and the right to execute. Of course, the judge will execute. The judge will be the one after the court of law that the Islamic state will execute the murder. And this is called qisas. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. Who has this right? The relatives of the one who was killed. Clear? The relatives will collectively decide, do we want to kill the murderer or not? And they have the right in the court of law to kill to execute and they also have the right to forgive. Now, can you imagine how tense that relationship will be? You have a brother, a son, a father who was murdered by this man. You're standing in the court of law and the judge asks you, what is your position now? Do you want qisas or do you want the other option which is forgiveness and move on? What does Allah say in the Quran? The judge has to say this verse. In Islamic law, the judge will say this verse that Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَمَنْ عُفِيَ لَهُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ شَيْءٌ Whoever finds that his brother has forgiven him, then let him follow up that forgiveness by being good to that family. Now, what is being talked about here? The murderer and the murdered. Allah is establishing, look in the end of the day, you are still ikhwa fil Islam. فَمَنْ عُفِيَ لَهُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ شَيْءٌ If the brother, your brother, forgives, meaning the qisas, he forgives, he says to the judge, okay, I forgive for the sake of Allah. And that is better, of course. In the eyes of Allah, it is better to forgive. Whoever forgives, then Allah says, once your brother has forgiven, then you better follow up by being good and, and being uh, generous and kind to that family. The point here for our lecture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the relationship between the murdered's family and the murderer, the relationship of ikhwa. Can you believe this? That even the murderer still has the ukhuwa of Islam. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a beautiful hadith a few days before he passed away. And this is one of the last <coughs> khutbahs that he gave in his life. He said in that khutbah that if I were to take a close friend out of all of you, and the Arabic word is Khalil. I would have chosen Abu Bakr as my Khalil, but Allah has chosen me as his Khalil, so I cannot choose anybody else. Basically, this is an exclusive relationship. Khalilullah is a term for our Prophet ﷺ, and also for the Prophet Ibrahim. Kalimullah is Musa, right? Kalimullah is Isa, excuse me, also as well, because both can be called Kalimullah. Allah spoke to Musa and from the word Isa was born. 
Khalilullah is both Ibrahim and our Prophet Sallallahu And Khalil is the highest strength of friendship. And Allah Azza wa Jal took our Prophet Sallallahu as a Khalil. Because Allah took him as a Khalil, then he cannot take anybody else as a Khalil. So what did he say? If I were to take a Khalil, it would have been Abu Bakr, but Allah has taken me as a Khalil, and therefore for Abu Bakr, walakin ukhuwatul Islam for Abu Bakr. I have the brotherhood of Islam for Abu Bakr. So the highest honor that he wanted to give, he used the word walakin ukhuwatul Islam. This brotherhood that Muslims are supposed to have for every other Muslim, it transcends everything. It transcends nations, ethnicities. Allah says in Surah Hujurat, we have made you into different tribes and different ethnicities so that you may know one another. لِتَعَارَفُوا Can you imagine how boring the world would be if we were all exactly the same? Can you imagine how uninteresting the world would be if our cultures and cuisines were exactly the same? We are fascinated by different cultures, different societies, different ethnicities. I love hearing the Trinidadian accent. It's very unique for me. Your cuisine, mashallah tabarakallah. Those spices, mashallah tabarakallah. This is a different culture. It's nice, it's interesting. How boring, literally how bland would, spi would cuisine be if we didn't have your spices. Think about it. So Allah is saying, I have given you all of these cultures so that you can have some ta'aruf, you can get to know one another. It's of the blessing of Allah, but the ukhuwa of Islam transcends that culture. It's okay to be proud of your ethnicity as long as the pride doesn't lead to looking down at other ethnicities. It's okay to like your country. It's halal, ya akhi, nothing wrong with that. Our Prophet ﷺ loved the tribe of the Quraysh, it's his tribe, but the Islamic Identity is always your number one identity. Nothing will trump the Islamic identity. You are first a Muslim and last a Muslim. Then you can be whatever you want. Then you can be American, Indian, Pakistani, Trinidadian. Then you can be this country, that ethnicity, this language. All of this comes next. And this transcends Islamic identity, transcends all other identities. Islamic ukhuwa, it transcends even genders. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ The believing men, the believing women, they are helpers of one another. We help one another out. The Islamic ukhuwa, it transcends time, past and present and future. As for the past, we are supposed to have a connection with Muslims who lived before us. In the Quran we are taught, we're supposed to make a dua. وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِن بَعْدِهِمْ those Muslims who come afterwards, they make dua. رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ And in every khutbah you will hear this dua. Oh Allah, forgive us and forgive all of our brethren who came before us. We don't know their names. We don't know their genders. We don't know their ethnicities. We don't know the era they lived in. But oh Allah, they are our brothers. Forgive them. رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا And our brothers, سَبَقُونَا They came before us. It transcends even the future. How can it transcend the future? The famous hadith in Sahih Muslim that when Uhud took place and all of those shuhada died and these shuhada went to Jannah. They're already in Jannah. As you know, the shaheeds are in Jannah. And in some sense, we can say that's in the future for us. In some sense, it's not of our world. Our Prophet ﷺ said, do you know what the shuhada, the shaheed said? Do you know what they said in Jannah? They said to Allah that, O oh Allah, who will tell our ikhwanuna fi dunya? Who will tell our brethren in this world that have been left behind that we are alive and well and living in Jannah? Can you imagine the ukhuwa that the sahaba had They've made it. They're in Jannah. They're flying around, enjoying Jannah. But where is their heart attached? When Allah asks them, what can I do for you? They say, Oh Allah, who will tell ikhwanuna fi dunya? Who will tell our brethren in this world that we are alive and we are not dead and we are enjoying and we are not in distress? So Allah said, 
I will take this responsibility for you. And Allah revealed verses that we recite to this day. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُوا فِي سَبِلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٍ Don't say that those who are shaheed and die as martyrs are dead. بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ They are well alive with Allah being supplied by Him. فَرِحِينَ بِمَا أَتَاهُمْ They are happy with what Allah has given them. The point is Allah responded to their plea. But what did these sahaba say? Who will tell our brethren back home? They've made it, but the connection of Islam is still there. And they're still wanting to give the image and the perception to the ikhwanuna fi dunya. In fact, this brotherhood of Islam, not only does it transcend ethnicities and cultures, not only does it transcend genders, not only does it, does it, does it transcend the past and transcend the future, it even transcends the human race. How so? Beautiful hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is teaching us manners. He's teaching us adab. And of the manners he teaches us is how to eat and how to drink. And how to go to the restroom and cleanse ourselves. This is all a part of our sharia. So he told us that when we eat some food and we eat a bone, we say Bismillah. And he told us that in those days, as you know, they didn't have the restrooms and washrooms. They would go and take care of themselves in the public, in the, uh, in the forest, in the, in, the, in the desert. And they would cleanse themselves with whatever material was there. So he said, hadith is in Bukhari, when you have to cleanse yourself after going to the restroom, after relieving yourself, then use some stones, use some this and that, and do not use bones. Why? Because... It shall serve as food لِإِخْوَانِكُمْ مِنَ الْجِنِّ The ikhwan that we have from the jinn. The ukhuwa of Islam transcends the human race. And we have brethren from amongst the jinn. They are our brethren in Islam and we take care of them by not polluting their food. Now pause here, what does this mean, their food and what not? Very simple. My dear brothers and sisters, we know that the jinn are another creation of Allah. Allah has created three creations with, with, that have intelligence. The angels, the jinn and the humans. And of these three, two of them have the will to obey and disobey. And that is the jinn and the humans. And of the two, Allah has blessed the humans with more intelligence and the jinn with more physical strength. So the jinn are powerful and the jinn are faster and the jinn can go, you know, do many things that we cannot do. But we have more intelligence than them and because of that we are superior to them. And because of that, Iblis who is a jinn was told to prostrate to Adam who is a human out of respect. However, the jinns, some of them are Muslim and some are kafir. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Jinn, in Surah Al-Jinn, وَإِنَّ مِنَّ الْمُسْلِمُونَ وَمِنَّ الْقَاسِطُونَ We have some who are Muslims and some who are unrighteous, some who are rebels and bad. So there are Muslims who are, there are jinns who are Muslims. And by the way, just as a, a, a side point here, as a tangent here, do you know that the jinns came to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanting to learn Islam, and he spent an entire night with them. And it is called the night of the jinn. So the jinn have sahaba as well. There are sahaba of the jinn. We don't know their names. But there are a hadith that the jinn have that we do not have. There are sayings of the Prophet ﷺ that he gave to them. There is fiqh that he taught to the jinn. The jinns don't make wudu before salah. They extinguish themselves. So the jinn have their own. <laughs> the jinn have their own fiqh. And of their fiqh, that we need to help them out with, of their fiqh that we help them out with is what? We help them by taking care of their food. What will the jinn eat? The Muslim jinns have a blessing because look, uh, I'm going into a tangent, but everybody loves jinn stories, I know. You're all mesmerized and thrilled with jinn stuff, right? Uh, and the kuffar jinn, they eat unhealthy, uh, they eat food that is uh, not righteous. What is not righteous food? Food that we don't say Bismillah over. Or they eat carrion, they eat swine, they eat things that are filthy for us, they eat najasat, they eat filthy things. When the jinn converts to Islam, he deprives himself from all of this food. So Allah promised the jinn an alternative, which is pure and better. What is this alternative? Every single food item that we Muslims eat, 
and we say Bismillah over that food item that remains, so the bones basically, the main thing here is the bones, will have a sustenance and nourishment for the jinns. So we don't pollute our food items by putting najis on the bone. If you wipe yourself, it have najis on the bone. So our Prophet ﷺ said that when you use the restroom, you need to wipe yourself, do not use bones because it will become food for your brethren of the jinn. Think about what Islam wants of taking care of our brethren. If we're supposed to take care of a brethren, we don't even see. Think about what Allah wants for the brethren we meet with, the brethren we physically are with. If even the jinn, we have to think about taking care of them. The Islamic Ukhuwa transcends all other identities. And it brings about many blessings. Of these blessings, of these blessings, what happens when we establish the bonds of Ukhuwa? Number one, you cannot be a Muslim without loving your fellow Muslims. You cannot be a righteous person without having a feeling of love for all other righteous people. And our Prophet Sallallahu mentioned this in the famous hadith, none of you truly believes until, what is the end of the hadith, you know it. You love for your brother what you love for yourself. This is known as the golden rule. Every single Prophet taught it. It is found in the Old Testament with Moses, New Testament with Jesus. It is found in the sayings of those people. We don't even know if they were prophets or not, but they are wise people according to their civilizations. It is called the golden rule. Do unto others as you would like to be done unto yourself. None of you truly believes until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And this is embodied in so many instances of the, of the Sahaba, of the righteous past. One of them, perhaps one that we can only idealize, we can never actually do in our lives, is the famous story of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala Ibn Umar once passed by uh, to uh, a merchandise, uh, it was actually a, a camel, he wanted to purchase the camel. And when the man saw it was Ibn Umar, so Ibn Umar said, how much is the camel? So the man gave him a very, very low price. This is after all Ibn Umar, the son of Ibn al Khattab, the famous Sahabi. He gave him a low price. He said, oh, it will be for uh, eight gold coins, eight gold coins. So Ibn Umar looked at the camel, walked around it. He said, no, nine. The man said, okay, nine. <laughs> Ibn Umar thought for a while, examined the neck. He said, you know what? I changed my mind, 10. The man said, okay, give me 10. And he kept on going up until he almost gave him double the price that the man had offered. And then Ibn Umar purchased the camel and walked away. His servant, who later became the most famous scholar, Nafi' and the chain of Malik and Nafi'. Ibn Umar is the most famous chain in Hadith. Imam Malik of Medina, he studied with this slave called Nafi'. And this slave was actually a sheikh because Ibn Umar purchased him as a slave, then he freed him, but the slave stuck with him and became a sheikh. And so Nafi' became the sheikh of Imam Malik, so Imam Malik from Nafi' from Ibn Umar. So Nafi' said to Ibn Umar that, oh Abu Abdurrahman, oh my teacher, the man agreed to sell it for a smaller price, why did you have to bargain it up to almost double? And do you know what Ibn Umar said? Because I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, none of you is a true believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And had I been the owner of the camel, I would have been satisfied, very happy with the price that I paid. Now, honestly, who amongst us can do this? Somebody wants to sell you a car for a cheap price, you will be the first person in line. And it's good that these stories exist to be ideals and role models. Because the fact of the matter is most of us, we cannot get to that level. But Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed us with righteous people we can look up to. At least the role model is there. At least the concept is there for us. That inshallah, maybe if we cannot do it in everything, in some things we can try our best. So of the blessings of being good brothers is that it is a sign of Iman. And you know what? Another point here, my dear brothers and sisters, mankind, humanity divides itself along many different lines. We divide ourselves based upon clans, based upon tribes, based upon ethnicities, based upon nation states. And if you think about it, and this is a very profound concept, every one of these divisions 
It has some sense, but it's also very shallow. Who cares if you have a person who shares your blood, who is committing a crime, and you will help him just because he's sharing your blood? Who cares if somebody of your nation state is doing something and you're supposed to support him just because it's your nation state? You should support values and not ethnicities. You should support the truth regardless of who is saying it and doing it. Correct? What does our religion teach us? The most important identity is the identity of shared values. And that is religion. Think about it. I'm an American. I was born in America. And yes, I am happy to be an American. And at some level, yes indeed, I'm proud in a halal way to be American. Alhamdulillah, it's my culture. I've grown there, I've raised there. It's who I am. But at the same time, I also say as an American that what is the one thing that combines all of us in America? It's definitely not our skin color. It's definitely not our ethnicity. It's not our blood. It's not our language. It's definitely not shared values. Look at all of the tensions happening in America between values right now. What's right, what's wrong? If you really think about it, the only thing that combines all Americans is the fact that they are Americans, which is a circular thing. Correct? You see what I'm saying here? So on what basis should I support every American just because he's an American? The same goes for tribes. On what basis should I support a tribe just because I happen to belong to it? On what basis? What does Islam teach us? You support someone who has the same value system as you. A Chinese Muslim doesn't speak my language. He doesn't have my cuisine. He doesn't have anything similar to me in dress or whatnot. But guess what? When it comes to right and wrong, when it comes to halal and haram, when it comes to respect and love and mercy and charity, we share the exact, we're on the same wavelength, even if we cannot communicate to each other in the same language. And that's what Islam teaches us. That Islam is that thing that gives us the framework to unite together. Of the blessings of, of, of being brothers in, in, in Islam, is that when you feel the love for your fellow Muslims, then you will taste the joy of being a Muslim. When you feel the joy of being a Muslim, you will also give back to the other Muslims. It's a circular thing here. When you're good to others, you will reap the fruits of your good. When you show your brotherhood, you will reap the fruits of that brotherhood. Our Prophet wasallam said, three are the matters. Three are the things. Whoever has them will taste the sweetness of Iman. Three are the matters. Whoever has them will taste the sweetness of Iman. Number one amongst them. That, that Allah and His Messenger are more beloved to Him than everything else. And number two, that He loves His fellow believers only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number three, that He despises to return to paganism or to kufr, just like He despises being thrown into the fire of hell. These are the three matters. If you have them, what happens? You will taste the sweetness of Iman. And one of these three is what? Is to love your fellow Muslims. So when you love your fellow Muslims, you will reap that love by tasting the sweetness of Iman. Of the blessings of loving one's Muslim brothers and sisters is the fact that one of the most obvious blessings, the Ummah will rise because of unity. And the Ummah will fracture and fall because of disunity. Through unity comes our strength. Through unity comes our oneness. And the fact of the matter, not going into a deep history of, of colonialism and whatnot, but wallahi, this is so true. That colonialism, one of the main tactics they used to destroy the ummah was the simple tactic of divide and divide and divide and then conquer small bits one after the other. This is one of the simplest things that took place. Beginning from 150 years ago, that the Western colonialist powers, and in particular it was Britain is no doubt number one on the list, but there were other countries as well. Wherever they went, the first thing they did, divided people up. This is this, this is that. The whole concept of nation states, of countries, is a concept that was imposed upon us from without. This is not something that we had as our own. 
And again, I'm going a little bit deep here, but this is the beginning of 2014. And do you know what happened 100 years ago? 1914. Who can tell me? 1914 is one of the most significant years in human history because it was the beginning of World War I. World War I. And World War I saw the collapse of the the caliphate, the khilafah. For 1,400 years we had a caliphate. It was good, it was bad, it was up, it was down, but it was a caliphate. It wasn't perfect, but at least it was a caliphate. In 1914, the first domino fell that would eventually result in the end of the caliphate. And, again I'm going into a tangent here, but this is very relevant, and inshallah I'll be talking about this throughout these next 3-4 years to commemorate not to commemorate, but to feel the loss. Commemorate is a positive word. But to feel the pain and the anguish of what happened 100 years ago. The Sykes-Pico Agreement, who has heard of this? 1918. Began in 1914, finished in 1918. Who has heard of the Sykes-Pico Agreement between a Frenchman and a British? Sykes was uh, British and Pico was French. In the end of World War I, they literally sat down in front of a map of the Ottoman Empire. And I'm not exaggerating at all. And they drew arbitrary lines. This will be given to this. This will be given to that. Germany will take this. We will take that. Uh, the, the French will take this. Uh, and so the French took Lebanon. The, the British took what is called Transjordan. And that's how they carved out Israel and they gave it over to the Zionist Federation. So the sykes pico agreement was when all of these countries of the Middle East, Iraq and Jordan and Arabia, and all of these lands were literally drawn out, the borders of these countries. And the reality was before these countries, there was no Iraqi identity separate from Islamic identity. There was no Jordanian identity separate from Islamic identity. There was no Lebanese or Arabian identity separate from Islamic identity. Before this time, these were provinces and Muslims were one identity. After this time, oh, this is Pakistani, that is Indian. This is Bengali, that is this. All of these divisions, most of you are ethnically from India. What did the Indians do? What did the British do in India? With the war of independence, with the Raj, what did they do? Divide and conquer. Divide, give this here, give that there. Create divisions when they did not exist. This is the reality. And I know this is controversial, but think, my dear brothers and sisters, think. Where did these countries come from? How long have they been around? All of this goes against that basic element, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Every single Muslim should be a part of a global unity, a fraternity of believers. But what has happened? We are now divided into over 60 countries, majority Muslim. And every country in the world has Muslim minorities. Over 60 nations have majority Muslim. This is the reality of the Ummah, where there used to be one, 100 years, and now there are more than 60. And just recently they divided another Muslim land, Sudan. They cut away another bit and gave it to another region here. This is the reality of the Ummah. What does Allah say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that, uh, or sorry, the Prophet tells in the Hadith that the Mu'min is like a brick to another Mu'min. The two of them strengthen one another. The Mu'min is like a brick, a foundation to the other Mu'min. And he literally, our Prophet did like this. He put his fingers together and he said, the believers strengthen other believers. يَشُدُّ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا So what do you think is going to happen if the bricks start breaking away? What do you think is going to happen if every finger is saying, no, no, I have nothing to do with you. And this is the reality of the ummah right now. Wallahi, it's a pathetic state we are in, my dear brothers and sisters. It's a pathetic state we are in. What is happening in Syria? What is happening in Kashmir? What is happening in Afghanistan? What is happening in Iraq? What is happening in Palestine? And the fact of the matter is every country and every one of us, we are simply worried about ourselves, ourselves, ourselves. If the ummah were to unite under the umbrella of La ilaha illallah, what force on earth could possibly stand against us? Think about that. But the fact of the matter is, every country, every ethnicity, every tribe, every nation state is worried about its own borders. And that's what Allah told us in the Quran. That if you don't do this, I'll quote this verse at the end, uh, that if you don't unite, well actually I quote it now because I'm getting to the point here. إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوهُ If you don't unite, Allah says in Surah Al-An'am, تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ كَبِيرٌ If you don't unite together, then there will be a lot of bloodshed and evil in the world. 
And this is exactly what Allah tells us in the Quran. Of the blessings of being believers, we're talking about the blessings, of the blessings of being believers is that our Prophet wasallam told us that the believers who love one another for the sake of their Iman, for the sake of their Islam, will be the ones whom Allah loves. And there's a beautiful hadith in this regard that a man, the Prophet ﷺ said that a man went to visit his brother in another village just for the sake of Islam. And Allah sent an angel to stop him in the path. And the angel said to him, where are you going? And the man said to visit my brother in Islam. So the angel said, do you have any other reason, a business transaction? He said, no. Do you want to discuss a matter of this world? No, I just want to visit him for the sake of Allah. So the angel said, I am an angel sent by Allah to tell you that Allah loves you because of the love that you have for your brother. Allah has sent me just to tell you that Allah loves you because of the love you have for your brother. Of the blessings that happens when we have this love for other people is that Allah will shelter us on the day of judgment when there is no shelter other than His shelter. There's a famous hadith I quoted in today's khutbah for those who attended. Seven are the people who will be sheltered by Allah on that day when there is no shade other than the shade of Allah. And one of those seven categories is Rajulani tahabba fillah. Two people, they had love for the sake of Allah. They met for His sake and they parted upon that love as well. So when you have that genuine love, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you. And there are many things to be pointed out, but the last one that we'll mention before we conclude, the last one that we'll mention is that the fact of the matter is we will not enter Jannah until we have this love for our fellow Muslims. And this is exactly what our Prophet ﷺ said. He swore by Allah, وَالَّذِي nafsi بِيَدِهِ He swore by Allah, لَا تَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ You will never enter Jannah until you believe, حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُ You have Iman. And you will never have Iman until you love one another. So he put the condition of entering Jannah to have love for one another. And then he told us how to have love for one another. And so I'll conclude this khutbah by some very brief points. How do we strengthen this bond of brotherhood? How do we strengthen? How do we make sure that we genuinely have these bonds for our Muslim brothers and sisters? Number one, number one, we should make it our regular habit to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Muslims that we know and Muslims that we don't know. Make dua to Allah for those whom you know by name. Oh Allah, bless so and so my cousin. Oh Allah, forgive so and so. Oh Allah, give my friend so and so extra wealth. Oh Allah, so and so doesn't have a child. Give him righteous children. And go ahead and be selfish when you make this dua. It's halal to be selfish in this regard. Why be selfish? Our Prophet ﷺ said, whoever makes a dua for another Muslim, Allah will send an angel to say ameen to his dua and then make a dua for the man and say, and may you also get the exact same thing that you made dua to him for, for him to get. So when you raise your hands and you say, oh Allah, my cousin so and so, give him a million dollars. Guess what? <laughs> An angel has just made dua for you for a million dollars. Go ahead and be selfish and put your trust in Allah that, oh Allah, I believe in your promise that if I make dua for him, an angel will make dua for me. So go ahead, this is the point of encouraging us to make dua. Oh Allah, so and so does not have righteous children, give him righteous children. And even those whom you don't know, Oh Allah, the Muslims of Syria are in great pain and trouble. Make their situation easy for them. Oh Allah, those women who have been expelled or, 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 or molested or whatnot in, the, in those battlefields. Oh Allah, give them sabr. Oh Allah, extract vengeance upon those who did this. You make dua for them. And guess what? All of a sudden, you'll feel a connection with them. You'll feel a connection with them because you're making dua for them. And this leads me to my second point. How can you increase the bonds of Ukhuwa? Find out what's happening in the Ummah. Be aware of what's going on. Don't live a life where you only think about yourself, yourself, yourself. Find out what's happening in the Ummah. Find out the situation in Iraq, in Burma, in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Palestine. And when you find out, this will affect your heart. 
My dear brothers and sisters, if you go to sleep every single night without once giving a care for the rest of the ummah, wallahi, this is a weakness of your own heart. It's a sign of a selfishness that is haram. And if you go to sleep thinking, here I am, Allah has blessed me with this bed, with this roof, with this family, and there are people that don't have this, and there are Muslims here, and there are people. You know what? You become a better human being. Human being. You become more tender, more sympathetic, more appreciative of the blessings you have. You become a better Muslim. Simply by thinking about other people. And this is the reality of Ukhuwa. And of the ways that we can increase this Ukhuwa, of the ways we can increase this Ukhuwa, this brotherhood, is by implementing the command of our Prophet wasallam when he told us what to do to increase this brotherhood. He said a number of things. Number one, give salams to everybody. Afshus salam. Every Muslim you see, give salam to them. Number two, visit one another. Visit one another. Just for the sake of Allah. Not for any business transaction. No, call up somebody say, you know what, we haven't seen each other for a long time. Let's just meet up five, ten minutes. Let's go to the coffee place. Let me come to your house. Let my family come. We can cook something. Just make something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, in terms of what you can do, giving gifts. Our Prophet said, give gifts, you will love one another. Tahadu tahabu. Give gifts. And you know, you don't have to think of expensive gifts. Because the problem with many of us, when we think of a gift, we think of a Rolex watch or something. No, ya akhi. Wallahi, something that you do with thoughtfulness, with care, with time. You just bring a small item that, you know, I came from such and such a trip and I just b b b I thought of you and I thought you would like this thing. Small box, small memento, cost $5, $10. It really is the thought that counts. You're like, subhanAllah, you actually remembered to bring me something. And when you give gifts, it brings tenderness to the heart. Tahadu, tahabu. Of the ways that we can increase the uh, brotherhood amongst ourselves. Of the ways we can increase brotherhood amongst ourselves is to realize the opposite, is to see the effects of not having that brotherhood. We live in a time and a place where the enemies of our religion are many. I don't know about you guys in Trinidad. We in America, we have the rise of the far right party we call them. The Islamophobes, the rise of those fear mongers that want to streamline, that want to castigate all Muslims as terrorists. We have the rise of these types of people in Europe and in America. And they are well funded. There was a survey, a study done two years ago where they talked about these groups and it was discovered that they have over a hundred million dollars of funding just for the sole, this is American dollars, just for the sole purpose of what? Of fear mongering. Now you tell me, my dear brothers and sisters, are we going to get a hundred million dollars to battle that? No, we can't. In America, we don't have access to that. They have networks and television stations. They have Fox News all in their entire grip. I don't know if you're aware of Fox News or not and, and the way it smears the Muslims. They have this, they have that. Now you tell me, what can we do? In response to all of this, what can we do? If even at this stage, we're hating on other Muslims because they're placing their hands here versus here. Because they're saying Amin out loud or silently. Because one is doing the ta'zim and the other is not doing the ta'zim. Because one is doing the mawlud and the other is not doing the mawlud. My dear brothers and sisters, I know exactly what I'm saying. These are controversial issues. And wallahi, I as an Islamic scholar have positions about them. I have Islamic positions about them. But hear me clearly. Even if you do it or you don't do it, in the end of the day, what we share compared to the people who are slandering us, smearing us, fighting us. Wallahi, we share 90, 95% of the same religion. We worship the same God. We read the same book. We love the same prophet. We face the same qibla. We do wudu. Everything is the same. Okay, we have disagreements. And there's a time and there's a place to talk about those disagreements. But I cannot and I will not preach hatred of other Muslims. I cannot tell one masjid to break away from another masjid just because of differences of a trivial nature. We don't have the luxury, we never did, but especially now, we don't have the luxury. The one thing that we have 
from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the khuwa of Islam. Unfortunately, we're even breaking that now. Over the most trivial of issues, my dear brothers and sisters, if even now we're going to take these minor issues to make cause for furqa, to make cause for ikhtilaf, to make cause for disunity, then when can we possibly unite? And inshallah tomorrow in the lecture that I have, I will talk a little bit more in academic detail about differences of opinion and when are they major and when are they minor. But today I want to conclude inshallah ta'ala on a very simple note, on a very simple point. No doubt, Muslims have different understandings of Islam. No doubt, there are those who do ta'zim, don't do ta'zim, do this, don't do that. No doubt, we pray differently and what not. But, the real question is, this group, whatever it might be, is it still Muslim? Yes or no? Frank question. Is anybody here going to say, because you do ta'zim, you're not a Muslim? I'll be frank here, I don't do it. And I think it's not appropriate, Islamically, academically. But if you do do it, guess what? You're still my brother in Islam. You still are my brother in Islam. Because you worship the same God, and believe in the same Prophet, and recite the same book. And guess what? Because you're my brother in Islam, all of these ahadith about being good to Muslims, it applies to you as well. Just because you're not a member of my group, doesn't mean I can exclude you from a member of the group of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do you understand this point? All of us are a part of the ummah -e Muhammadiyah, the ummah of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is what is the main characteristic of our ummah. We believe in this Prophet, in this book, in this God, in this Qibla. The other differences, I am not saying they're all trivial, some are big, but there's a time and place to discuss them. And that time and place is never amongst the masses. It's never on the mimbar of a masjid to castigate another masjid. All of the Quran and Sunnah that talks about having ties of kinship with other Muslims, it doesn't say with other Salafis, with other Sufis, with other Barelibis, with other this, with other this Darul Ulum, with Asja. No! Islam is above any one group. I have said it before and I will say it again no matter how controversial this might be. Yes, we have differences. Yes, there are Salafis and Asja and Deobandi and Darul Ulum. But Islam is above all of these groups. And Islam unites all of these groups. And that is the ultimate reality that La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, it is shared by all of these groups and platforms. All other differences, there's a time and place to discuss them. But we have to be united in the face of this onslaught. And we need to show this unity, not just through mere talk, but also through action. And inshallah, I will continue along this theme and topic tomorrow night. I'll conclude today by reminding myself and all of you of a very simple hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, and it is called the hadith of the Hukuq al-Islam, Hukuq al-Muslimin, the rights of the Muslims, where our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that al-Muslimu akhul Muslim, the Muslim is the brother of the other Muslim. لا يظلمه, he never does injustice to him. ولا يخذله, he never humiliates him. ولا يحقره, he never trivializes or denigrates him. He never trivializes or looks down at him. المسلم أخ المسلم. And then he said, التقوى ها هنا. He pointed to his heart, he said, the piety of Allah, it is in the heart. And then he concluded this hadith and he said, it is enough to be considered a sin that any Muslim thinks himself better than or above another Muslim. It is enough of a sin to think you are holier than another Muslim. This is enough to be considered a sinner in the eyes of Allah. Everything that a Muslim has is haram for another Muslim. His money, his wealth, his honor, his property. Maluhu wa damuhu wa irduhu. All of it is haram. It is not allowed for you to denigrate or look down at another Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to have, that our Prophet told us to have. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He has gathered us here today, 
to express that love and to show that unity. I pray that insha'Allah we are gathered as well in Jannat Tajim al Tahtiya Lanhar, in Jannat al Firdaus al A'la. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleanses our hearts of the evil, of the rancor, of the jealousy that might exist for other Muslims. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces that rancor with mercy, with tenderness, with compassion. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes us to rise up above petty differences and to see the reality of the strength that he has blessed us with. And that is the strength of Islam. Wa da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka adi muhammadin wa ali wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Takbir. Allah. Takbir. Allah.